Gwe, hello. Ninda Luisi, Alex Noel. My name is Alex Noel, and I am a Mi'kmaq artist and activist. I'm from Cornerbrook, Tagamgook, Newfoundland. And I want to start by acknowledging that this event is taking place on unceded, unsurrendered, Beatuk and Ilnu territory. Tonight, I want to speak about indigenous resistance in Newfoundland and Labrador. Though I recognize that this provincial jurisdiction is a colonial mapping of the land and doesn't reflect traditional indigenous territories. But first, let me tell you about some of the things that indigenous peoples in this province have had to resist. Historically, we have resisted genocide. In the 19th century, European settlers effectively wiped out an entire people of the island, the Veatuk. Historically, we have resisted the denial of our existence. Joey Smallwood famously insisted that there were no Indians on the island of Newfoundland. Historically, we have resisted assimilation when residential schools, among other methods, were used to strip from us our cultures, languages, and identities. I want to talk about two present day examples of indigenous resistance, the Halapu enrollment process and the environmental disaster of, Mus of the Muskrat Falls hydroelectric dam. These are two pieces of a broader colonial project designed to disenfranchise indigenous peoples and further colonize indigenous lands in this province. I also want to take this opportunity to discuss where these issues fit into the provincial and national conversation about reconciliation. A couple days ago, I finally got a, a decision letter on my membership status from the Halibu First Nations Band. Like more than 80,000 people, I was told by the Canadian government that I was not Mima. I was told by the Canadian government that they understand my identity and my ancestry better than I do. The enrollment process was largely based on a point system that required applicants to submit proof that they had participated in activities considered by the government to observe a traditional Mi'kmaq way of life. Some of these activities deemed Mi'kmaq practices include picking wild berries and attending St. Anne's Day Mass. You were required to then prove your participation in these activities by providing tangible evidence such as newspaper clippings or photographs. The enrollment committee was also particularly suspicious of applicants who no longer live in the community. And regardless of the connection to our culture, many of them had their status revoked. If this isn't ridiculous enough, imagine having your application denied while your twin sibling has theirs approved. This was actually the reality for a family undergoing this process. It is clear to my community that this enrollment process is not working and the government is trying to shirk its responsibility to our people. Another example of this is the Muskrat Falls project. On October 22nd, 2016, land protectors cut the lock and entered the Muskrat Falls hydroelectric dam site. This action came after years of appeals and protests and amid an ongoing blockade of the project site. Four people were on hunger strike at the time. Locals described it as a last resort, an act of self-defense when the government and corporate interests involved failed to adequately protect those who lived downstream from what a peer-reviewed scientific study projected would amount to contamination of traditional foods and exposure of indigenous populations to unsafe level levels of methylmercury. On a Facebook live stream filled by journalist Justin Brake, I watched from my home in St. John's as land protectors peacefully entered the site. Among the protectors were elders, mothers and children, an Anglican minister, all putting their bodies on the line to halt construction of the dam that would have devastating, irreversible impacts on local communities. The footage of this event was crucial to anyone outside the gates in trying to understand what happened on the site that day. Justin Briggs' footage showed what other media outlets did not, a peaceful occupation of the site Protectors shaking hands with workers. Workers offering food, words of support and understanding. Prayer taking place, even a hulik lighting and drum ceremony. At the very same time, mainstream media, the province and Nelcor were making claims that these peaceful actions were a threat to public safety, while refusing to use the term protector, instead referring to them as protesters. It might seem like a matter of semantics, but this distinction is important. 
By not referring them to them as land protectors, the colonizer is able to avoid confronting their own culpability and the destruction of the lands and waters and the violence against indigenous people. Mainstream media was also quick to misrepresent peaceful indigenous resistance as violent, but they were careful to avoid using the same words when describing the actions of police officers who violently intervened in the resistance, handcuffing and dragging away protectors who were upholding the principles of peaceful resistance. As a result of this peaceful sit-in, 28 protectors that occupy the site that day, along with journalist Justin Brake, are now facing criminal charges. More than 30 others face civil contempt charges related to the demonstrations. If the protectors are facing criminal charges for entering the Nalcor site to save Muskrat Falls, the land and water that sustains life for so many people and other living creatures, what charges should the Canadian government face for trespassing on Indigenous land for 150 years? The federal government has taken away status from the Halapu Mi'kmaq, dividing us, our communities, and families. But we are a people who know who we are, and we are breaking through the silence that has been imposed upon us by church and state. We are resisting. Indigenous peoples in Labrador are faced with irreversible environmental damage, threats to their health, culture, and livelihood. All across Turtle Island, Indigenous peoples are faced with these threats, from Standing Rock to the Elsa Buktuk First Nations, but they are resisting. In this political context, it is hard to conceive of reconciliation, but I believe there are concrete steps that everyone can take to move us forward to true reconciliation. We can move forward together. Everybody can contact their elected representative and demand the charges against Labrador land protectors and Justin Brake be dropped immediately. You can also donate to the protectors' legal fund. Overcoming this legal challenge is a crucial step in forging ahead with our collective resistance. We can't wait for Justin Trudeau or Dwight Ball to stop the violence against Indigenous peoples or we will still be waiting 150 years from now. We also can't allow Canada to define our identity, define the terms of reconciliation, or the terms of our resistance. We must define it for ourselves. Wulalio, thank you, everyone. <laughs>